Wait. So we're going to start the class with <laughs> Janet complaining about the videos. Yes, I did. The last, the second one? They're there. Because I was looking for it. Oh, well, you have to look harder. <laughs> okay. So we left off talking about piston rings. And we last thing we talked about was the oil scraper. So we have, normally we have top two rings or what? Compression. Compression. Then we have oil, oil control. Oil. Then the scraper. scraper. And the word, and on a compression ring, the word top goes to the top. Top of what? Toward the top of the cylinder. Towards the top of the piston. All right. What's the top of the piston? Okay. Flat part. Okay, flat the head. Uh, okay, and then so we have the oil uh, control ring. Which way does the top go on that one? I haven't heard the right answer yet. So it goes to the top. Oil control ring goes top to top. Now what about the scraper ring? Depends on what the manual says. It may say put the top go up. may say put the top go down. All right. And then one of the things you have to do is measurements. Measurements. Well, there are two measurements that you have to be concerned with. One of them is the ring gap. Ring gap. Ring gap. And how do you do the ring gap measurement? I wonder if I could make like an actual circle if I put something circular in there. Almost. Maybe if I didn't have a big chunk of metal here. Whoa, look at that. That's a. I'm gonna have. Wow. Ah. All right, that's. <laughs> viewers will be impressed. Okay, so there's my there's my cylinder barrel, and I put the ring in. Well, now here's where it all falls apart. So the ring is gonna go in there. <laughs> this is harder than you think. I'm making fun of me. All right, I should have just went like this and just went dot dot dot, so you get the idea. All right, so we have to measure. Oh, that's really too big of a gap. So we have to measure this gap that's created right here, right? And how do you measure that gap? Feeler gauge. You guys are so old school. If you were really cool, you'd have a ring gap tool. A ring gap tool. And um, it is a wedge, and the wedge will go in there, and it's got all these little measurements on there, and you just drop it in until the ring comes to a certain point. If the ring comes to this point right here, then you just read what it says on there, and it measures the gap out for you. But you don't have that, and a lot of people don't, so what do you have? A feeler gauge. And so you're going to measure the gap right there with your feeler gauge. And sometimes you have to add a couple of them together and do the math on that and uh, get it all together. The danger here is, is not so much, well, of course, you have a minimum and a max. Uh, if you, what's going to happen if your gap is too big? Too much what? You said it, Benjay. A loose compression, blow by. Um, Depends on what ring it is, you can get too much oil in, not enough. All right, so we have that danger, but I suppose if, you know, if I had to pick one bad versus the other, I would rather have it too much. What if I have the gap is too small? Well, actually, depending on where you measure it, you especially with most cylinders are choke bore, you measure it up at the open end, and you, and you measure it, and then when it goes down to the choke, that gap gets smaller and smaller and smashes into each other until it breaks the ring. It'll make room. It's got to. So it'll smash and little pieces will come out. So that would be really bad. So you have to be careful where you measure this gap exactly. Now, and I've asked a lot of you, well, where are you supposed to measure the gap? And not too many of you have figured that out yet. It's right in the manual. Two inches from the uh, combustion chamber? Two inches from the combustion chamber? Yeah, the ring. Well, the ring. Right? Top of the stroke, so it's really all the way down in there, which is the top, is what it says. Now, not all engines are that way. Some of them will say measure one inch from the opening, but they've already thought about the fact that there's going to be choke and they've taken care of it. So you just have to follow the manufacturer and measure it exactly where they're telling you because they're thinking about, it. does it have choke, is it straight bore, and so they're, they're taking this into consideration. So make sure you, you do that. So, um, so you're going to place it in the cylinder and then of course you have to have it square and I already showed you you're just going to use a, another piston to put it down in there. So 
Um, I don't really say anything about ring gap. I just said it all. Um, ring gap. That's all we need to say about ring gap. And then we also have to measure the side, side clearance. And I showed you uh, in one of our slides here that side clearance is done and the piston and Really, I, I can't explain it here as well as I can show you in, in the lab exactly how to do it. But who has not measured their side clearance yet? Everybody's, you guys are last, last year? Okay, so there's a trick to doing it in, in a way that you can do it much easier. You guys think, everybody knows the trick? Yeah. Yeah, makes more sense, all right. So we gotta measure that <coughs> and the side clearance. Uh, all right, installation. All right, so now I have a nice circle to work with over here. I'm just going to keep this, right? Um, okay, so when we're putting the rings on the piston, they're easy to break. They're not as easy to break when they're brand new. It's once they've run for a little while that they become easier to break, which is why I don't want you to take them off, especially the oil control ring. Those things get so dang brittle. They just break so easy. Even new ones break relatively easy. So if you aren't going to change the rings, the rule of thumb is you just very carefully take the two apart, set them aside. Okay, these rings are on this piston. It's going back in there. Just leave it alone. Don't mess with it. And that's kind of how it's done. Uh, if you are going to be changing out the rings, well, at that point, then you got to rehome the cylinder. You're going to get brand new rings. You're going to take the rings off out of the package. They're going to be marked nice and clearly. This is the top and this is the part number. You're going to verify which one's the top, which one's the next compression, and which one's the oil control ring. Because sometimes the top two are the same part number and sometimes they're not. Some engines may want the top one to be chrome and the next one to be plain steel and then go to the oil control. Some of them don't want either one chrome, depending on the barrel bore. Some are both chrome. So you're going to look at the part number and, and I guess I told you about superior air parts. I used to love buying superior air parts stuff when they, they started doing rings because they would come in a nice little box and you'd open the box and right on the top was a card that said, this is the ring order that it goes in and these are the gaps. And they're almost always correct. You didn't have to mess with them too much. But every now and then you get one that, um, if you have a side clearance problem, you just have a problem. Uh, if, if you don't have enough side clearance between a ring and a piston, Chances are you have the wrong combination. You got the wrong ring for the wrong piston. If you have too much side clearance, what does that tell you? You got a worn piston. So how do you fix that? Oversized rings? No, no, no. <laughs> get a new piston. All right, ring gap. Ring gap, I was constantly changing ring gap. So if you, you do the ring gap, you check the gap, and it is too big, what do you do? Get a new ring. Get a new ring. All right, usually... You have to get another oversized rings. All right, but um, too small, what do you do? Got it. You've got to grind off the side. So you can either file it or um, I used a grinder. There's ring uh, grinders, things you can do. But you have to be careful when you do that to make sure you, get, you do a good job and you break all the edges and you file everything clean. Um, just like good practice when you're working on, on aluminum stuff. And you guys had 03, uh, 0300. They wrote 300. I'm like, always on you guys about dress those edges You're really important on the rings yeah How much are rings? depends on the engine 290s are stupid expensive on regular engines are pretty dang cheap didn't you say there was a plane or an engine that had silver that's bearings oh bearings, bearings yeah um so like first uh, an engine that's very popular ring sets are about 25 bucks a cylinder 25 to 40 bucks a cylinder Huh? The 290s? 290s, I think they're back down in price, but for a while you couldn't find stuff. It was like 110 a ring or something like that, 150 a ring. Yeah, <laughs> don't break the ring, that's why. All right, so uh, anyway, you do have to j check the ring gap side clearance. <laughs> Installation, you're supposed to, I say, I always did. You're supposed to gap the rings when you put them on and you're putting the engine together. You don't want the gaps all lining up, right? And the reason why they say, oh, don't, don't line up the gaps is because, um, in theory, you're going to get a bad compression reading. 
I happen to know error is pretty good at changing corners. So if you have a gap here and a gap here, I'm just being kind of silly. I, I know that error can find its way around and through, but the theory is if the gaps line up, you could suddenly get a really bad compression reading. And so the remedy for that is whenever you have a bad reading on rings, you're always supposed to take the air, airplane out and run it because the rings actually rotate at, oh, I forget, I've got it written down, something like once every 90 seconds or something like that. Uh, I may have it written down Just somewhere. From, oh, from once every five to seven minutes, right in front of me. Okay. What's that? Just from vibration? Vibration and the running and the crosshatch that's put in there tends to make them spin. And we know that to be true because if they didn't spin, then the very, uh, the top ring has that little gap you would see it wear a groove right in the cylinder where it never rotated, and the last one would have a groove where it never rotated. We don't see that, usually. And so that means they're rotating. But if you do see a little wear that's sticking up, well, that means they weren't rotating. So, all right, installation. So, rings should be installed. Rings should be installed installed so the gaps are not aligned. So the gaps are not aligned. And so where should you put the gaps? Uh, you know, I don't think I've ever read anything that says it must be this way and because they rotate, it's they're gonna change anyway. So you can put the gap for the first ring here the second ring there, and the third ring there. I like that, that's kind of my favorite because I think about this sitting just like this inside of a cylinder, and I'm gonna have oil that's gonna pull up and, and be pulled up right around here, so I kind of want my oil control ring with the gap up here. So that works for me. Some people say, oh no, you should you know, put like one here, or like, like this, one there, one there, one there, so one, two, and three here. It's all okay with me, whatever you want to do. I don't have any data that says it's got to be a certain way. But I like, I like 180 out. All right, rings should be installed so the gap's not aligned. Let me see, rings do rotate. Rings do rotate uh, at a rate, at a rate of, we'll say 360 degrees every, five to seven minutes. <coughs> so says Lycoming. And in theory, if ring, ring, gap does align, and in theory it kind of has to every now and then, does align, uh, the compression reading may be low. Where would it tell me that I'm leaking from? Rings. So if a re, uh, the compression reading may be low, um, which would be showing worn or defective rings. All right, and what, what is the, the big no-no here with, uh, if I have a chrome barrel I never use? Chrome, chrome, chrome rings. rings. And you would think that that would be something that's like, well, where would that ever come up? And I see it happen actually quite often. Uh, what happens is people who aren't doing things like they should be. So you have an aircraft and uh, the cylinder goes bad on the cylinder. And uh, well, this is a scenario that I actually know that happened. And, and so, oh, the cylinder went bad and, you know, the guy flew it somewhere and he's off airport, you know, away from home. And his buddy says, oh, don't worry about it. I got it. I got some spare cylinders. I'm just going to grab one of my spare cylinders. I'll meet you down there. We'll swap out that cylinder. Good to go. You know, and so he runs down there and they pop off the cylinder and they leave the rings on and the piston and they put on the new cylinder, but the cylinder they took off maybe was plain steel or nitride or steel barrel. And the one they brought was chrome. So the rings that were in there were chrome and that would be really bad, right? So that happens. And then you're going to make a mess of everything. So don't do that. Uh, measurements, installation. All right, let's move on to... Piston pins. You did what in your pin? What? Um, 
Yes, you in the front. I want to make your life hard. Well, <laughs> so nothing's changed in the last 20 years. <laughs> um, so when we're looking at the uh, pistons, there is a part number printed on the inside of it. And yes. You can reference the manual yes. and see what they're made out of. Uh -huh. yet, yeah. Made out of? What metal is? What metal is used? To make the piston? Yeah. Okay. Like it'll be like aluminum, blah. It says in the manual. They're all aluminum, but okay. Well, yeah, but you can like, it says it anyway. So. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, like today I went over to you and I was asking because they the part numbers on them changed. Like on the them, what is them? <clears throat> well, when I went over today to you and you're, well, I was looking for the rings because I was trying to find out if they were yes. or aluminum. But the, or, or chrome or plain, but the, uh, the part numbers changed on them. On? The, the piston, okay. that the rings went on. Yep. So we weren't sure if that affected any of um, okay, let me get finished with Katie. So, is there a way to tell what the cylinder is made out of without just knowing that, oh, 0290 uses straight, you know, without just knowing that, is there a way to look in the manual? Okay. This, um, yes and no. Okay, so, so I think this is going to tie into your question, and this is going to be off this, but it's a really good topic to bring up. So, when you're, when you're working on your engines, and you, you see stuff in the table of limits that says something like, all right, uh, ring, ring groove, uh, ring, ring on piston. So you want side clearance on piston. And then in, you can't, it doesn't just say, well, 0290, this is what it is. It says, well, an 0290 with chrome rings, 0290 plain rings. All right, and you're, you're left in this kind of, I don't know which one to choose. All right, that's where this job starts to get a little more difficult. And you really have to be somewhat of a detective and figure this stuff out. And it's good that some of you are being a detective because it's never okay to just assume and go, well, I just went with this one, you know, and, and we joked around in 309. It's not a good joke, but it was like, you know what? I just kind of went with this and then I would say, oh, and I guess we'll just let the NTSB and the FA figure it, sort it out at the crash site, right? So you guys have been awesome about really asking good questions and not assuming anything, which really makes me happy. So, all right. So it's helpful to be immersed in this world of engines because then you start to see more and more things, you learn more and more. But so much of the information that you're looking for is in the service bulletins and instructions, which are on the table, but they are this thick, right? And you guys haven't, nobody's asked to take it home and read all that. I noticed. Put it in the, put it in the canvas. Uh-huh. Same canvas. Not all of them, that's for sure. Oh. <laughs> just a few. I just took the ones applicable to, to the 290 and took some of those and put them in there. I mean, literally, have you not seen the books? They're that thick. It's over six inches thick of material. Uh, and some of it is, is a little obscure. And so anyway, so to answer your question, so how do you figure out what these things are made out of? All right, so along with the service bulletins, letters, instructions, there are also supersedure parts books that you can get from Lightcombing that'll give you a trail. And so a lot of times, and I had some really good uh, documents that, that were at my shop uh, out there, where I could look at the cylinder part number. So the cylinders are usually have a part number somewhere on them, and I could find that part number, and then I could look, and it would tell me right there, this part number, 76829, is a plain steel cylinder. All right, or I could see and look, and, and, and uh, or maybe it would say the 0290 only came with these options. You just start to learn these things, okay? It only came with those options. So, like, for example, the 0290 only came in two different types of cylinder arrangements, the plain steel and the chrome. It's all they ever made, right? And how do I know that? Well, because that's supersedure book, being in the industry, reading service bulletins. So it only came in two, two versions. So I could take that, I can go to another service instruction that tells me piston and ring combinations. And I can look in there and it says the 0290D should have this piston right there. Okay, it's got the, if it has chrome, it has this one. If it has plain steel, it has this one, and they're both the same part number piston. All right, go to the next column. The rings should be compression uh, for chrome, cylinders this, compression for uh, plain steel this. You follow? So you just have to get really deep into these service instructions to find that stuff. Um, now, when we're talking about cylinder barrel uh, finishes, I'm, I'm going to get into that at some point, but just, okay. So if you take all of Lycoming, 
they only came in three different flavors. So 290 came in two, right? They were what? Chrome, Chrome, Chrome or plain, plain, plain steel. Okay, add in the third option for lycoming. They only made three options now, and that was nitrided. So what is nitriding? It's a, it's a chemical hardening process. So basically you take a plain steel cylinder, put it in the ammonia bath, and the nitride goes in and I have a hard cylinder. All right, so what's the difference between a plain steel and a nitrided? It's really the same bore pretty much. It's a steel bore. One is hard, one is not. Okay, but they're different. If you had a plain steel cylinder, they made them very straight. I don't know why. They're just, they're, I call them a straight bore. So they had no choke, no taper. And remember, taper is something that makes it, it's, uh, sorry, choke is, is something the factory wants. Taper is something that wore. They never made a taper cylinder. They made a straight bore, and then it wears taper. All right, so now you've got straight bore, which is what kind of finish? Plain, plain steel. Plain. Or I've got a chrome, which is easy to identify. Uh, and then I have nitrided, which has a, has a choke. All right, so you, you put all those together. Now, why are you laughing at me? Because <laughs> you could have just said in the service instruction. Huh? Because you could have just said in the service instruction. No, no, but I think this is good information where it's, it's service instruction. You can quit listening. All right, so <laughs> so, so then Lycoming, uh, they actually, uh, well, we'll get into color striping, what all that means. Now, you look at Continental, and you've got all this, okay, nitride, plain steel. For whatever reason, Continental never got into this. They're like, they're cylinders, man. What are you worried about? They're steel. So, you know, do you nitride them? Yeah, we nitride them. Don't worry about it. You know, it's like, okay, so, so like Continental just nitride their stuff and they don't make a big deal of it. Um, they just, yeah, whatever, we do that. Um, and, but they did have Chrome for a while. Chrome was really came into fashion for a while. Um, actually, I think it started way back in World War II uh, as a way to recondition cylinders. And so a cylinder would wear, then you would bore it oversized, get a bigger piston, run it till it wore out again. You couldn't, maybe, maybe you can go one more size over and get one more bigger piston. Then they say, well, now what do we do with it? Well, let's just chrome it. We'll put chrome and bring it all the way back to standard. So chrome is always standard. There's no, no such thing as oversized chrome. So they bring it back to chrome. Well, I don't know, you know, I wasn't around at this time, but the benefit to chrome was it didn't rust. So, you know, that's the problem with airplanes is sometimes they sit for a very long time. So there became this, uh, for a while it was, hey, how about when you buy your brand new engine, we'll just give you chrome cylinders. You don't have to worry about the rust. And people were, were going for that. Um, chrome has some problems. We'll get into that. Um, then they decided to try some other things. There was Sermonil, um, some other chrome. I'll, I'll think of it. But anyway, a bunch of different hybrids. And some of them worked. Some of them didn't. So does that answer the question? I'll give you at least an overview. Maybe that was too yeah. much of a... Don't laugh at me. I answered it too well. Is that what the problem is? Yes. To the point where you got bored. Okay, wrist pins. Uh, well, it connects. Connects piston to conrod. Uh, they are made of what? Steel. Steel. So we'll put high strength. strength steel. Um, are they solid or hollow? Hollow. Hollow. Yo. Did you not have the piston pin for the connecting rod that went thump, thump, thump? No, I don't. I bet it was fine. You think so? Yeah. yeah they're, pretty, they're, pretty, they're pretty hard. Um, all right. So they are hollow. Uh, there are three classifications. Three classifications of piston pins. Uh, I've, in all the work I've ever done on aircraft engines, I've only seen one style, and not this one. So they're stationary. Stationary, which is not free to move and locked to the piston boss. So not free to move and locked, locked, to the piston, piston boss. What is a piston boss? Who is the piston boss? That's those holes that the pin goes through. That's the holes the pin goes through. All right, so we got stationary. We got semi-floating 
What? <laughs> Would that come with a four-piece Conron? Does it? If you can't remove the piston pin, then you would need... Dust. Oh, no, it's... it's it's yeah, Sorry, four-piece con. Yes, it is, it's pinned to it, so you can undo it. Okay. Like it would have a screw or something that would go through and screw into it. Okay. All right, semi-floating, which means it sinks very slowly. Mm -hmm. Now it's... Um, Slotted and locked to the conrod. <laughs> Slotted and locked to conrod. And then the only one I really know about is full floating. Full floating. So it is free to float. That's kind of redundant. Free, free to float. Um, not locked. What kind do you have? Full floating. Full floating. Uh, that's the most common. Most. So if um, let me see. Oh, I do. I do talk about this. All right. What you have are piston pin plugs. And I'll go more into piston pin plugs in a minute. But so what you're, you're, you have a full floating uh, piston pin that's free to go back and forth. And when it goes too far to one side, then you have the piston pin plug, which is aluminum, rides along the cylinder wall. And it can kind of go the other way and you have a aluminum plug that goes on that wall. And so that's just what it is and go back and forth. No big deal. It kind of keeps it sort of centered enough that it actually works. You don't always have to do that. Uh, sometimes there are piston pin, piston pin retainers. Piston pin retainers. And, and so instead of allowing the piston pin to move and touch the cylinder wall, you'll actually put retaining clips, circlets, if you will, inside of the groove that's in the piston itself. So, um, right there. Keep. Piston pin retainers that keeps keeps pin from damaging cylinder wall. So it really it kind of it locks them in. They can't move, but they're still free to rotate. So you still call them, I'd call them free floating, but they're they're free to rotate around inside. Um, steel. steel. Yep, it's a little snap ring. So fit in a groove of the piston boss. They fit in a groove of the of piston pin boss. Uh, but you have uh, piston pin plugs, piston pin plugs, which is the most common. Um, let's say this most common. Most common, and they are non-ferrous. What does that mean? Not iron. It means you can't grind them on the bench grinder. That's what that means, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just going to keep with my timeline. But I'm going to circle back around on that. Let me see. Um, I'm going to tell you about this. Just so you don't think I'm magic or something. You don't burn me at the stake for being a witch. Mm -hmm. So somebody who had their piston and, and the pin, and they gave it to me, and I put it in. I kind of felt it. I go, ah, you're about two and a half thou. I don't remember which group that was. All right. So, right. And they kind of look at me like, what are you, you're like I'm a witch or something. And then, oh, then you guys came to me and said, no, no, our, our piston pin is actually bigger than the hole that's supposed to go into. So I put a little oil on it, cause I, and I put it in there. I feel it. Nah, you're, you're just, a, just a shade smaller than a thousandth of an inch. All right, how do I know that? Um, I don't know why I put this in here, but I'm gonna, because it's just a nice, it, it, this, this counts for everything, but I put piston, piston pin fit. Now you're gonna know my secret. All right. What's that? Oh, that's a good point. Warlock, I think is the <laughs> All right. Um, usually a push. I missed that, sorry. Push fit. All right. uh, push, uh, 
push fit, um, I don't know why I wrote that in there, but it means, but it means you actually have to push it in there, uh, which means it's a rather <laughs> tight fit, so sorry. Uh, not a press fit, okay, it's the opposite of press. So press fit means you have to put it in a press and you actually have to press down upon it. All right, so push fit is a nice tight fit, but you can still push it together. So then I'm going to tell you this. Zero, zero, one, one thousandths of an inch is about, is about the smallest clearance, smallest clearance you can assemble, you can assemble without a press. So you get smaller than that, the clearance, the difference between the two, you, you need a press. Something's got to be heated, something's got to be cooled. Uh, or you've got to press it together with a machine. So you can go up to, so if I can push it together by hand, but it's kind of a really tight and super machine fit, it's like, wow, that's, you know, got it has to be oiled and it felt really nice going in there, then I'm going to say, okay, that's about one thousandth of an inch, and there'll be no play. So 0 0.002 um, will allow sliding, will allow sliding, um, but almost, almost, I gotta roll up, no play, no play. So in other words, I put the piston pin in, and I've got part of the piston pin sticking out, so I can move it up and down, and I feel that. If I have no play, then I know that I'm probably tighter than two thousandths of an inch. And then by the time I get to 0 .003, um, we'll have we'll have perceivable side play. Spell perceivable right. P E R C E I V perceivable play. So now I'm going to start feeling a little bit of wobble going on in there. And so there you go. That's my, my witch trick. 